Hello. Hi. Ian. Hello, Caroline. Caroline, I'm just getting, my voice is all over the place today. Um, well, I have water. Do you have water? I do, actually. That it's helps. weird water. Yes. Yeah. Are you locked down, Ian? Um, as much as one is able to, in as much as that uh, physically, yes, but uh, mentally, I don't think that'll ever happen. <laughs> you and me both. Uh, and also, there's a long, there's a, there's a big world out there that's connected. So, um, yeah, I don't feel locked in. I don't feel locked in. What a wonderful answer. Ian, might I ask you to introduce yourself as to who you are and where you live? And the reason for my question to you about are you locked down is that now I am global, people assume incorrectly that Wales is England. No, 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 no. no. So I'm now, I'm making a, a perfect um, example with an English, are you English, completely English, Ian? Um, well, I was born in, I was born in London, uh, um, as my father put, put it, uh, at a, at a, in an English adventure. So um, he was from Glasgow and uh, my mother is from Newcastle, um, up in uh, Geordie land up in the uh, northeast. Um, and they came down to London, and uh, I was born in um, uh, Kensington and Chelsea. So, wow. uh, um, and that's where I grew up. Um, but uh, I now live one change of horses north of London, uh, on the uh, Great North Road, sort of coming out of St Al uh, St Albans, just um, just north of London. And um, St Albans is famous for, t for a number of things. One of them is uh, St Alban. Um, where first English martyr, uh, he was a Roman soldier that was beheaded by the Romans, um, and um, it's also the home of the Hot Cross Bun. But there are a lot of pubs in St Albans because they used to bring the coaching uh, on the coaching days. They used to bring the horses, change the horses there, so they used to go into the coaching inn, have a glass of beer, while they actually changed the uh, horses and uh, ca uh, carried on. And there's a very steep hill. So they get to the top of the hill, change the horses, glass of beer, and off. That, that, that information will please an awful lot of men, I'm sure. <laughs> and as for, the horses, the... as for the horses, did they get any drink at all? I, who knows. Um, but the weird thing is, it's also the, the home of the hot cross bun, because um, uh, an, uh, an enterprising local baker um, used to sell it to the pilgrims. It was the main pilgrim pilgrimage site in the UK before Canterbury and uh, so everybody used to come to the uh, um, the church of St Alban um, and it actually has the longest nave in of any of the churches in the, the cathedrals in in the UK and it's the only cathedral that's also a local parish church so um, we got married there at the high altar so we got married at the biggest church in the, in England School. And in fact, we had um, uh, around about 2,000 people witness our uh, wedding. Wow. Did you wear a kilt um, by any chance? No. I'll stop you there because we haven't heard your name uh, given Yes, correctly. my name is Ian Moncrief Macmillan. Can you explain and to listeners the, uh, the origin and orientation of your Christian names, middle name and surname? Yes. So Ian, uh, again, is, uh, you know, it's, they're all Scottish names. So uh, Ian is a very common uh, Scottish name, but there's many different ways of, uh, of spelling it. And I spell it the very simple way, I-A-N. Um, then Moncrief, again, an old family name, Macmillan, uh, our family name. So we do have our own tartan. And uh, um, my uh, uh, two boys actually had... Um, well, uh, my son had a, a tartan jacket for a, a wedding that um, he went to as a best man. Uh, so a friend of mine, he was one of the page boys. He had a little tartan thing. And we also, for our wedding, our page boys had uh, little tartan jackets. But we didn't want to, uh, waistcoats, but we didn't want them to have um, kilts or anything like that. It's just, uh, it's not us. <laughs> uh, but my, um, uh, I went to... Uh, 
uh, you, you know Tom Ball, uh, we did a, a series of parties uh, with like-minded companies, Christmas parties, summer parties, and they got completely out of hand. So we had um, a thousand people in the Hippodrome one time and you know, we did all sorts of crazy things. Um, but all the other companies there had a logo and I thought, I don't have a logo. So I um, thought about having a logo and I thought the only logo that I can have quickly um, was actually my tartan. It's so awful. I got... So I got one of the uh, one of uh, Tom's people to create a little logo, and I found out later that um, somebody who teaches personal branding uh, was using because um, I, I bumped into somebody at uh, HSBC. I said, "Oh, you're in Ian Moncrief Macmillan. I need to come and see you." <laughs> and what happened um, is that this person was teaching the bankers how uh, corporate bankers how to create personal branding, and she'd had some of our invites for the parties the parties that we'd actually had and she held it up and said who here has got their personal branding sorted out and all the companies had their logos and there's me who was feeling a bit insecure so i created this logo and it was just my name and my tartan and so i was the sample because i was the only one that had it personally branded so in order to not confuse the listeners if they're from all parts of the world, about the tartan, about the name, and about me, the host, being Welsh, I think I'd like you to explain what, how we met and why we met. Uh, we met um, through a, um, uh, a global uh, business social network um, called Academy, but it was a, a sort of a group within Academy. Yes. Uh, um, and yes, it started in the UK uh, because the founders were based in the UK, but it actually spread out all over the English speaking world and, and beyond. Um, but we met actually in London um, yeah. when uh, it was actually, I can't remember, it was still, that network was still going on or it was after. Uh, I think it was after probably. Um, it's something that uh, a, a friend of ours, William Bust, put together. It was it? Was, um, uh, first Friday sort of lunch? It was. It was. The Academy in, had uh, closed and William yep. had invited members of the Academy, Blackstar. Were you a Blackstar? Yes. Yes. And to explain to, to listeners, what does Blackstar mean? Uh, it was one of those weird things. Um, Academy was an inter it was a collection it was a, a, a social network across between facebook and linkedin it was before all of those started and it just allowed um local business people people in business on their own or smaller businesses to actually come together have their their sort of social connections uh, and blackstar was a group inside that that was a, a for life membership uh much more select and um uh, very strange so i i, I yeah, I'm not really a small business. Yeah, that's not my field. Uh, at the time, I was actually rescuing big banks from losing their licenses, and I helped a couple of banks, some of the biggest banks in Europe, merge and all sorts of other things. Um, but I just liked the people. Uh, and so I just uh, joined this network, um, and somebody said, why don't you join Blackstar? And I thought, yes, fine. Uh, and, and I just liked the people. And that's how we met after it finished. The connections and the conversations have still carried on and the friendships that were formed then have still carried on. Uh, not everybody got on, but the majority did. And um, it's just having that opportunity to actually connect. And yeah, and so William carried some of that on. It's sort of grown from there. Uh, different, you know, different, different gatherings have, have come out from, from, from that. Um, but yeah, we met, and I think it was actually, um, I can't remember where we physically met. Was it actually it, it just was, outside it was, crossing the road? Yes, it was before we went into um, the lunch meeting. And the lunch time meetings were known as lunch at a specific restaurant. Now, I'm explaining this part to listeners because it's quite important as to how impressed I was by Ian Moncrief Macmillan. I had been traveling for three hours and that was just to get to Paddington, London. So viewers and, and um, listeners w listening to this would understand that that means somebody like me traveling from Swansea had to get up an hour before that anyway. So add that into four hours, gets to Paddington, 
breathes a sigh of relief because she's actually in London and then realizes, no, 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 no. You've got to get a tube to wherever the lunch is being held. So I can remember two things about all these experiences of going to academy meetings, academy lunches, is that the gentleman on the platform, which was the information gentleman, would be the very person I would absolutely fall in love with because he'd say, you look lost. And I'd go, I am. And then he'd point me in the right direction to get the right tube. So fast forward, I'm now on a, on a pavement outside a place that I think is the lunch restaurant. And then I meet you. So you know, it, was, it, was actually a, it was actually a panic. Um, I remember because you actually said, I, um, I'm running a bit late. I'm not sure where I am. Uh, where am I? And uh, so, uh, and we met just outside in the middle of the street, just on Oxford Street. Oxford Street. Uh, um, in the summer, it was quite hot. Um, you were a bit flustered and I can, I, I can understand why. Um, so we just went, right, so we just sort of said hello and we actually and then sort of, um, then you came up into the meeting and it's, um, the, the restaurant itself is quite clever because downstairs they have a canteen. Do you um, remember the name of it, Ian? Uh, Vapiano's. Uh, Va Vapiano. Vapiano's. Thank you. Uh, what they well, it's very clever. They have a canteen downstairs where you can actually go and get pizza and pasta, and it's freshly made. Um, so you get a card um, and you pay at the end. But then upstairs there's some space to uh, to sit and eat and stand and do things. So we actually t typically congregated there. Um, so, but it's very confusing if you don't if you it's a big building. Very confusing and difficult to find people because downstairs it's people milling around getting food and things and upstairs it's a bit quieter um but it's a nice space it's a, it's so nice anybody space listening me. in now to the carolyn williams show dot tv realizes that the second person i met which was really about five hours later in the day on my <laughs> traveling said to me would you like a drink <laughs> To which I replied, oh, yes, please. And so you became quite a um, memorable host. Yeah, and, it's, and it wasn't my event, but I think that what I like about it is that it, it's nobody's event. It was, um, William very kindly organised it um, and did put a lot of effort in um, and came up from Wales as well to do that. But um, it, it, it's, it's good to just meet. And so we're all a host. <laughs> We're all hosts, but it, it, yeah. it's easier if somebody knows <laughs> the direction, the um, orientation, yeah. the, the mapping, yeah. the tube connections, the time. Yeah, exactly. And does the train run on time? Now then, I, I'm explaining that because I don't know if how often you would travel by train, but I used to just travel by train for a total year, I remember, when I had one of my spontaneous thoughts of selling the car to, and that was to um get cash to go on holiday with my son that was the reason i did it it was very spur of the moment thinking hence a year later i'm traveling by train to work and to london and in those days the trains were notoriously an hour late or maybe didn't turn up or whatever so i now have a healthy respect for intercity trains if they run on time yeah, and I, um, I I like train journeys. Um, uh, I like long train journeys because I do some of my best thinking on trains. Um, yes. I did a job um, up in Birmingham, and uh, two companies, two, 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 two things. One, I was doing something for Legal and General um, to help them uh, do some restructuring um, of one of their businesses. But just going up, Going up there, um, so I commuted daily to Birmingham. So I had a small drive to a local station in St Albans. There's two stations. Um, the Abbey Station, it takes this little train that goes to Watford, which is a sort of a bigger town. And that's on the main line from London to Birmingham. So it's a very fast train. And um, because I was commuting every day, I bought a first class ticket um, on a monthly basis because it was not much more than a normal ticket. And it meant that I could get in a nice space on the train. Um, I had a very nice breakfast. I, I made sure I only had the cooked breakfast once a week. <laughs> um, 
and you can have some space. And I found that uh, just having space to think and talk, you know, think was actually fantastic. Looking out the window, um, we also meet some interesting people. Uh, we were the same Absolutely. people traveling every day or quite frequently, but we didn't actually ever speak. And then every so often, the train was there was a big exhibition in Birmingham. They've got the National Exhibition Centre there. And every so often you get a train that would be crammed full of people. So they take some of the first class carriages out and declassify it. So we'd all be pushed up right up at the top. So we'd have to actually sit there and talk. Um, and I met some fascinating people. It's, so a we bit, that it's a little bit like COVID-19, isn't it? That people now are talking to each other. Yeah. It's a little bit like that. Who, who, um, yeah. Who wouldn't, you wouldn't, you wouldn't. Um, yeah. It's, People, people, people are sociable again. Um, I used to, we used to go down to Cornwall. Um, hopefully, we'll go down this year if we can. Um, go down to Cornwall uh, for the summer, and I used to commute backwards and forwards on the train line from Paddington to Penzance. And um, what a, uh, if you can get into the dining car, it's a fantastic uh, meal. And um, and once you get to Plymouth, they don't care. Uh, they don't kick you out. So uh, a glass of wine. Uh, good company and i've i've met some fascinating because people board just meeting. Over it, it's what i call a natural environment for a board meeting yeah it's the, it's the just, way to um, travel it is four people um three people you meet some fascinating fascinating people um uh, and the stories and you just um you know, you, you have you have to relax after a while so gin and yes. tonic glass of wine a good steak <laughs> and you're uh, chatting yeah. Yes. And it's because it's a long journey. Otherwise, it's um, that reminds hours. me of an occasion um, to London. But again, another five hour stint. I have to say that because I, I heard so many people think Wales is England that I have to differentiate. Well, we're, 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 we're four nations. Four nations. And they are. And they are. Yeah, they are. They are. They are. Oh, well, what are they? OK. Yeah, um, what are they? Um, uh, well, Great Britain itself is actually the big island. Um, the United Kingdom. Um, so you've got uh, England, Scotland, Northern Ireland, um, and Wales. And I put Wales last because um, I just just because I could see you waiting. Um, but we're all four, four nations. Come here. Yeah, it was four nations. Um, but we've also got you know Channel Islands and other bits and yeah. pieces um, from uh, Isle of Man. Etc. So it's all uh, it's um, yeah, and abroad. And so we've got all sorts of little bits, and and it's interesting what's happening with Hong Kong. Um, yes, as we got the overseas uh, national passports. And I believe uh, somebody was saying recently that um, uh, soon there's th I think there's about three hundred thousand people have one of those passports, uh, and there may be a ch if things change there may be a change that they can come here and there's about another three million three and a half million people who are entitled to one so we suddenly or two and a half million people are entitled to one so we may suddenly find that we have um uh, three million hong kong chinese over here which would be quite interesting do you, think, do you think that the air bridge would have been um, constructed by then and lifted and launched uh, who knows but that's that's that would be interesting that would be interesting i want to make um a recommendation really in terms of somebody who invited me on this journey on this particular occasion and his name was Marcus Gauci and I'm interviewing him after you tomorrow and when you mentioned it's a great way to travel that's exactly what I did because he'd asked me to travel and find as a Welsh person the Jubilee Club in Waterloo you can imagine the gentleman on the platform information desk in Paddington was certainly somebody I remembered again saying to me, yes, you'll have to, and gave me the directions. And I met the embankment, the London embankment. So that was kind of like historic for me in moment in time because there was water. And as you know, I live by water. So the it's, fact it's, that I was near water was immense. It's a, it's, a very, it's a very interesting part of London as well, just down, down there. Yes. Uh, it was a time when I was in between um, work um, and we'd actually bought uh, Madame Tussauds um, operated uh, all sorts of amusement parks around the country so that we had um, 
Thought Park is where uh, near us. We used to actually go and take the kids there. But they also had his pass. We could go to all of their theme parks on one pass during it for a year. And that included the London Eye. So when I was actually um, in London, I was in between interviews and I had an interview in the morning, interview in the evening and, you know, doing things. I used to get bored. So I used to go and just get to pick up another ticket. So these I used to get straight to the front of the queue. And I think I've been on the London Eye something like about 200 and something times. Because uh, I just used to just go around for a quick whiz. And, um, and I've seen, you know, just uh, jumping on and then behind me, a whole bridal train, a whole bridal party jumping on to go and do a spin round and then coming out because uh, a lot of um uh, a lot of marriages happen in um uh, county hall which is just just next door so yeah that's that is exactly the excitement of the magic of it is what hit me and i revisited the embankment last year on invite again which is much easier because it was informal and it wasn't for um, a formal meeting but um i took several several photographs of the fact number one i got there safely number two i was staying in a luxurious hotel number three the thames was there and um i think the queen had done something pretty spectacular at that point as well and i can't remember what it was it was either a tribute for some sort but um the thames itself had been lit up and the oh bridge, so it's time for the one of the, the jubilee Jub it was a jubilee yeah yeah. So the atmosphere was electric, which is why I love London. The energy, when there is something like the invite I had from Marcus was during the Olympic um, hosting from London. So it was absolutely, the only word I can, and my eyes will do it, buzzing. And it was buzzing, I was buzzing, and I had to do a presentation. So the whole thing was buzzing. And I just loved it. I absolutely loved it. But the, the visit last year was on a different um, energy vibration. Why? <laughs> because I'd broken my hip. And oh, um, no. yes. And it meant. Because yeah, cause suddenly I just wondered where you disappeared to. And I said, it's, it's only now that I realized. And yes. um, I feel very bad that um, well, I wasn't paying attention. I, I, I kept it quiet, very quiet, because I'm the type of person that being self employed, I'd need to get back on my feet pretty sharpish. So I kept it fairly quiet as to, I really didn't know if I'd walk again. So that was the, the truth of it. Yeah. And my surgeons yeah. were giving me the option of, you either have a hip replacement or you have a partial hip replacement or you have a dynamic screw. And none of it made sense to me because I'd walked into this particular place with two legs that were functioning quite well and ended up having this choice 12 hours later. So yeah. the mind was kind of, mm, I don't fancy any of them really. I just want two legs that work. Yeah, the weirdest thing is that um, uh, when I was at university, uh, I actually did a hip operation, hip replacement operation, actually in the lab. <laughs> Sounds very gruesome. Uh, what we were given, um, the, we, the Imperial College, uh, it's before they had all the medical stuff that they have now, which has helped grow the university. Did you qualify it yet? Sorry? Did you qualify? No, I was a, I was a, mecha a mechanical engineer. So I was in the mechanical engineering. And what, what, um, what, we, what they were doing is the mechanical engineers, one of the professors, was actually doing some work on different materials um, and different designs for hip and um, hip replacements and for uh, knee replacements. And so we, we were asked to actually do a, um, a sort of a hip replacement operation just with the tools that they had. So just in the lab, so just two bones. I don't think it was human bone, but it was uh, just to actually test and build to make sure that it was easy to do and that the tools worked. And then we part of the testing was to actually make sure that the actual joints themselves were working and the glues worked and everything else um so we were actually asked to actually look at the mechanical properties it was very 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 weird uh, so what did, what did you go for in the end but it wasn't what i i didn't have a choice they i was in their hands and they had to find right. and they had to find a surgeon to actually do it so it meant that i was two days in a lot of pain because i couldn't take the analgesics they were giving me oh nasty so I was, uh, for two days on a drip just waiting for, praying rather, for a surgeon to turn up. So the person that was chosen to do the operation honestly did a fantastic job. 
And the answer to your question was it dynamic screws, but they're oscillating screws so that they swivel. Right. So I have three oscillating screws in the high femur. And I had to spend, and my daughter had to nurse me and I would say tolerate me in a lot of pain. Because they, the surgeon, and I would say the consultant surgeon, who was obviously overseeing my case, was telling both my daughter and myself, there is no way you were going to put pressure on your leg. You have to be non-weight bearing for months. Now, if, yeah. you, t if you say that to a fitness professional, non-weight bearing for several months, there is something that happens to the brain. Yeah, just, 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 Yes, it says yep. to the brain, you can't run right. anymore. And I've seen a wonderful quote, Ian, which is perfect for this to explain it. When animals, this is obviously prehistoric, when animals broke their femurs, they were obviously killed because they just couldn't get away. And that's basically how I thought, because I just couldn't move fast enough to do anything. So the reality of that quote hit me when I had to cross the road on crutches. So if you cross the road on crutches and you can hardly move without pain and you have a sergeant major for a son who says to you, don't worry, I'll stop the traffic. It's, um, it's I'd call a learning curve, a painful one. Uh, yeah, and you're, you're very dependent on other people. And if you're yes. very independent, suddenly being dependent on other people. Yes. Uh, two things, one, guilt. Uh, and, and not wanting to be a bother, but actually, um, uh, and also being quite difficult, uh, we, we can't help it. Um, but it's it's a bit, the people around you want to help. Yes, they did. So, and I had I had you know so you kept it very quiet, which is um, you probably hadn't realised how many people actually do want to help. No, th but thank you for that. And um, in future, uh, not that I want to repeat that kind of experience ever again. But it's, it's a wise thing to understand that there are people out there yeah. we have lost contact with. So the very thing I learned from somebody else, which is about giving in, and it's about learning to do that kind of, it's called surrendering. And I, I sort of thought, surrender, what do I surrender? Is the white flag going to come up? Who am I surrendering to? And it made sense. It actually made sense eventually because there was nothing I could do. So yeah. the surrender bit was quite um, a spiritual level. Uh, and luckily for me, my daughter's got a fantastic cavalier, Spaniel, who was at that point two, three, three years of age. And she instinctively just lay down beside me the whole time for a week while that's, I was that's, beginning that's really to good. Yes. And therefore, I have huge respect for the animal world because she was my nurse. Am I carer? Very, very simple things, but it does make a big difference. Yes. Um, to that, that connection and just being there. So, it's, uh... so, so the visit to London as an invite was a special one because it was the first time independently I got on a train and I did tell the manager of the train, I have broken my hip, I am rehabilitating, I'd better tell you just in case. And that, that was the change of all. Before I should have said it, I never said it. And as soon as I said it, I had VIP treatment. Amazing, isn't it? It is. And um, uh, depending on where you're going, sometimes at the other end, somebody to come and um, pick you up in a wheelchair. I know it sounds a bit sort of, I don't want to do that. Yeah. But sometimes it actually is quite nice to uh, whiz through and just not have the burden sure. of actually just being whisked through. Uh, I think the, the, the quickest um, uh, the quickest I've actually done arriving at an airport and being on an aeroplane, uh, I think that was uh, 11 minutes. <laughs> and um, it was to fly to New York with Virgin Atlantic. And um, they had a their business class, their upper class um, seats. It was we it was fantastic traveling with virgin um and uh, they sent a limo for you and the guys working for kept on kept on waiting he said why are you going to new york i said well yeah because you're sending me well justify it and all this was stuff and i thought this is just crazy um and so eventually we late we're very late the 
guy in the uh, the limo driver was talking to the airport saying we've got a late somebody late arrived there 11 minutes later i was just whisked through security whisked through passports through whisked through everything, and it arrived on the plane doors shut and we we're off yeah. and uh yeah we had quite a party the thing about uh, virgin in those days is that it was quite a party uh and uh, we actually got uh, we actually got very good at bouncing the champagne corks off the ceiling uh, into the bucket at the other end. One There's time, Richard Branson uh, listening to Calorie and Williams show here. <laughs> well, we did. Uh, we, there was a group of us that travelled uh, London to New York quite often, so we got to know each other. Yeah. Um, and uh, which at the back of the bubble, there's a nice little area. We used to play charades. And one time, the uh, crew, as you said, there's a good film on. You know, you know the drill. We'll come and give you a meal later. Uh, so we just helped ourselves, and we actually got very good at bouncing the champagne. There's a nice curve on the top of the bubble, so we've got you good at sort of bouncing it off and trying to hit the uh, the, the bucket at the other end of the. Uh... But it was good fun. What good fun. what was your position at that point? The job spec. What was the task? Uh, I was building. That's when I was at Bankers Trust, um, and I was sent over to New York um, to build a. Um, one of the world's first securities trading systems. So there's um, uh, we were the gilts market um, was going through big bangs. So they're bringing these new market makers and different ways of doing things. And Bankers Trust was one of the six market makers. Um, so I spent a day in, on the trading floor and understanding how the trading floor worked and the flows of deals between sales and traders and markets and things. Uh, and then the next day I was uh, on a plane uh, with an inside the gilts market book to understand the mechanics of the uh, how the gilts worked, uh, and then I was in New York, and um, uh, nobody had actually really put together these type of trading systems before. Um, and but I felt at home uh, because I built part of an op- the part of the command and control system that was used for the Royal Artillery, so I had a that sort of that sort of um, sort of Fire, doing fire missions across a battlefield it was very similar, similar to actually throwing trades across a trading floor um, and understanding it. So I knew how to design it. And most of the people uh, that I was working with, uh, clever, you know, good people, but they had not um, done a real-time command and control type system. They were used to batch operating system, batch systems, you know, doing the accounting in the, in the evening, you know, overnight, sort of taking all the, and So this was actually dynamic real time uh yeah so we built something and uh uh only i was meant to be only there for three months we were there for six i came back to london and uh well as soon as we arrived there it was a cash market so it was only sort of cash bonds and suddenly they said we need futures and options we need all these derivatives things um so i had to rush backwards between london and new york for about three months you know week here week there time clock <laughs> that's not a bad um, commission yeah, and then um, and then we uh, yeah, so we had to fix the system up, go live, and so, it was. So, what? How would you describe yourself in terms of that title? What were you at that point? Um, yeah, God, I don't know. Um, title, I don't think it really mattered because I was uh, I had a very boring title within the bank. I think uh, I can't remember a very lowly title. Um, but I just, you know, I just software engineer. I just got on with to writing the software. Software. Um, but but I had some very 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 later on in the next iteration we did a global bond trading system for euro bonds and for other things. Um, I remember actually having some very senior people uh, reporting uh, reporting to us because we just with the team in London we just didn't understand all this authority stuff. We just, uh, Bankers was a very go get it type company. Um, they're now part of Deutsche Bank, actually. Deutsche Bank bought them. Um, but we, uh, yeah, we were this little London based commando team that didn't really take any prisoners. Yeah, uh, I've said that. And I've heard that mentioned often. I don't take Yeah, and we had, a, we had a really good team. And f- funny enough, uh, the group at Bankers Trust, they, 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 they really did have something very special, um, way ahead of anybody else. And just recently, I've reconnected with some of the guys I used to work with and some of the guys I used to work with. Um, you know, many years ago, we've just reconnected on Facebook. Yeah. Uh, and it's just, 
that the only time I've ever been physically scared in my professional career, and I've had to walk into boardrooms of banks and have to actually give <laughs> give them quite a difficult, you know, be quite difficult with some of these people. The only time I've ever been physically felt tense was when I got someone to see one of the people in, in New York um, and uh, one of the very senior people in IT uh, at Carmine and uh, I felt very intimidated just walking to his office and actually waiting for him. and um, he was a very intimidating person and I, from what I understand that his family from where they come from in New York you never know they may have you know who knows what history they have in that sort of uh, part of the italian uh, american community so i'd heard rumors but i felt very intimidated the first time i ever felt very very scared and he just said um i just want to find out what you were doing okay that's fine you can go now <laughs> but connecting connecting up with him many years later just saying he's actually a very warm interesting character mm -hmm. but he had a very tough job to make sure that the bank really um, did something that was very, very powerful, and he yes. kept it absolutely straight. Can I ask you the question of your height? How tall are you? Uh, I've shrunk recently. Um, I used to be six foot something, six foot two, six foot three, six foot that sort of that sort of height. So I that, shrunk. That's something I remember. You being very tall, as I am very small. And since uh, that moment in time. One of the things that helped me through to become a speaker uh, with Brian Rose on London Real was never think small again. No. Because um, if you come from a, a small, stocky race like I do, which um, if, you, if you're interested in rugby, it's the scarlet, it's the Tlenethi background, where we produce these lovely little jinxy players. I think Liam uh, Williams would be the current to tackle. one. A big pardon. Yeah, difficult to tackle because the way the um, centre of gravity is lower. <laughs> yes, but when you mentioned that you were scared for the first time, physically scared, I just wondered: was it the person's persona, or was it their height? What and or was it the whole no, thing? It, um, the, um, the, uh, uh, he's, he's actually a really nice guy, and he had a really tough job. And it, uh, what he created was truly magical and way ahead of its time. Yes. Way ahead of its time. Clever. Um, and he, but he ruled it with an iron fist for the right reasons. And yes. uh, but he had this um, sort of scary persona, persona. Uh, which he needed to. Um, and I remember one of my first days, uh, <laughs> my first days uh, actually in uh, New York, and I had to go and talk to somebody. And he said, "Oh yeah, yeah, I've been waiting to see you. Uh, hang on a second, I'm, I'm busy. I'm busy now. Oh, yeah, come with me." And he picked up this baseball bat out of the side of the out of by the side of his desk and he said right we're going downstairs and he walked down to the trading floor which was quite a big trading floor and he walked around with his baseball bat and he actually banged the top of the the reuters terminal monitor so they could see all the you know the bloomberg i, I think there was no reuters at that point and they were banging the um the the, the, the terminals of the traders and saying you're going to put your prices in because <laughs> we had to uh, the, every they had to put their prices the yeah. day so we could mark everything to market and do the analytics and he just used to walk with this guy this another guy um they just walk around and i thought crikey you've got you've really got to just you've got to be a bit physical sometimes to get yes. to get what you need to get yeah. people's attention he, he was the uh, caller yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, but again what I'd, i've i've never that was the only the only time i ever felt it was just very nervous very weird but um I've never felt that in any other any other time. But, but was it, just it a successful had... outcome? Yeah, absolutely fantastic. Everything yes. was it was a really good time. And, so celebration, um, time for celebration then. Uh, for our, our, when we came back to London, because everybody was here, and we had teams come over from London, and I actually organised a party. And uh, I rang. Um, I thought, well, I'm going to see my dad. Um, so we wanted to go somewhere outside the city. We wanted to. Go, uh, so we went to a place in Notting Hill, um, in Ken at the bottom of Kensington Church Street. Um, there was an old um, barracks, uh, cavalry bar barracks, and they'd moved it down to the one down in Knightsbridge. Um, but this is where the uh, barracks were, and there was a wine bar in there, um, Jimmy's wine bar. And we thought, well, that'd be good fun. We can, you know, we can get a little bit. Uh, out of order as we used to do um, so we thought we'd go there so I rang up made sure that everything was okay I said well we've got a few more people can we have a few more tables yeah no problem no problem 
Um, food, can we do some sandwiches? Yeah, no problem. Arrived there a bit early because I went to see my dad very quickly. I hadn't seen him for a while. And I went down to the bottom of Ken Church Street to go get there a bit early before everybody else. And all that was left physically of that building was the outer wall. The whole barracks, which they've been using as a youth centre, sort of a um, sort of host- youth hostel, uh, the whole of the barracks have been demolished. It's just the outside wall. And they were building a, just about to build a shopping centre. So what I realised, I've been dialing the number, and I've been somebody at the, the uh, site telephone have been picking it up. I said, table for how many? Yeah, no problem. <laughs> I can see what happened. You probably made shift with bottles in your hand. No, no. So what we did is we actually panicked and went somewhere else, and we went to this Mexican restaurant in. Um, Covent, in Covent Garden that just opened and we thought oh we can't we can't be bothered with food so we just did all these sort of starters we just had rounds of starters and these big jugs of um of uh, frozen margaritas and tapas. um tapas? Sorry? Tapas. yeah sort of tapas sort of type sort of Mexican all sorts of different things um and then these jugs of margaritas started frozen margaritas started appearing and we said we didn't order these and he said yeah don't worry um, we've never seen this is we're fairly new here and we've never seen so many people, so many jugs of sangria, uh, frozen margaritas disappear so quickly. So um, they're on the house. They're on the house. I was waiting for that. They're on the house. Yeah, and then we sort of we staggered out of there somehow. And I thought, oh crikey, I better go and. T- t-. My wife was actually um, at a place um, with her traders. She was uh, in the Eurobond market, um, and she was uh, there with her, her team. Um, so I thought, well, I better go and stagger over there and actually uh, we'll go home together. And I was feeling quite sort of as if I'd actually achieved something. I was quite pleasantly sort of yeah. <laughs> buzzing. Yeah. And I arrived there and I actually felt sober in comparison. <laughs> but the only thing is that her team... Yes, that's that the achieved. adrenaline and excitement. Yeah, but they were absolutely... They'd been doing these, um, uh, what are they called? Uh, tequila slammers. Oh, right. So they've gone to a place called Break for the Border, and they were they were completely and utterly hammered. The other thing is that my wife had drunk them all under the table. <laughs> so maybe explain what hammered means, if there is, and there will be listeners. Um, yes, they were, um, they were finding it difficult to have uh, coherent conversation. Conversation. On that fact, note... Conversa- conversation, yeah. Bringing you fast forward to who you are now to me, so we're talking 15 years ago. So fast forward 15 years to you currently. Um, this is the point where I explain to listeners that you have lost your dad. And that was yesterday, I believe. Yes. And I believe, if I'm right, that you told me his name was John. Yes. And you very graciously still accepted to be on this live with me on the Carolyn Williams Show TV, and how much admiration do I have for you? So, can you explain the reasons for why you said that's okay? I'll do this. Um, well, we're good friends, um, and I need to um, I need to spend some time to actually come to terms with some of the things. We, um, my parents got divorced um, when I was uh, just coming up for thirteen. Uh, so, um, it was a crazy, crazy time just, uh, growing up. Um, uh, yes, yeah, sort of the, uh, uh, sixties, seventies, just, yes. all, just buzz, buzz, go, go time. And, uh, a lot of money flowing around. My dad was an antique dealer. Uh, and we went from a small house to a very big house. Uh, in fact, we actually, um, uh, at the end we grew up, um, uh, my parents, my dad bought a house that actually wanted the paintings. So we bought that. We bought that. We, we had to buy the house to get the paintings, and he made enough money in the paint from the paintings to keep the house. And we lived in a, a big house in the top of um, Campton Hill Square, which is right in the sort of prime part of Kensington, Kensington. Uh, which is like one of the prime parts of London. Yes. And um, this studio at the back uh, was just a complete mess, and the estate agent was just saying, you know. 
uh, my dad was, you know, sorry about the mess. My dad said, don't worry, a skip will clear it up. And that was the value was in the paintings. Um, and in the end, so we actually turned it into a ballroom because it was a ballroom. We had it repainted and, um, and my brother and I used to use it for um, roller skating around. Uh, and they had a sit down party for about 300 people. So it was cra crazy oh, times. Ring. Yeah. And ring. I went to a local school, interesting school. Um, uh, you know, lots of lawyers, bankers, diplomats, um, but also people that worked um, the BBC. There's um, one of the guys uh, who used to go out for tea, as you do with kids. Um, and his dad did the voice art, was a voice artist for the BBC. And we didn't know whether we were going to have Captain Pugwash nice. turning up, which is a funny pirate character, uh, famous in the UK, or, or one of the Daleks, one of the sort of Dalek sort of voices, or a Cyberman um, the noises. So, do, so um, how do you describe that kind of upbringing with who Ian Mongrief McMullen is today? Yeah, so yes, so the reason why my dad was my dad, um, parents divorced, um, things sort of changed after that. Uh, my dad went up, eventually went up to Scotland with my uh, stepmom um, and uh, my uh, uh, stepsister, uh, my sister. Uh, so it's very different breaks. So there's a different, yes. so there's a separation. And then I went off to school um, in the countryside. So I had five years of, um, of uh, you, know, you know, quite a sort of strange school. Um, uh, yeah, so that, that's why that sort of separation, that distance in some ways. So, so would you yeah. say that that's, uh, I would, educated you or armed you or boosted you or deterred you from doing anything? in life that no, you wanted to do? No, I just realised you can just see that, um, yeah, it's crazy stuff. Um, so my dad was very good at what he did. I wish I'd learned from him how to negotiate. Uh, he was an uh, ace negotiator. Um, uh, but just simple things. Um, I remember one time it was uh, really liked fishing. So we went, uh, um, so a call that he, somebody wanted to sell something. So he um, he went off to uh, so we packed some fishing gear and uh, went off to this house call, and um, it was a for piano and a, uh, p a piano this lady wanted to sell and uh, a piano stool, and um, as we we're driving up there, he saw the car car parked just in one, uh, just in a side road, just sort of nearby. So he thought, oh, somebody is somebody is also. Another dealer is actually looking around there. So we went in, had a look at the, the piano, and he said, yeah, nice piano. Um, I'll give you uh, 250 quid for it, 300 quid for it, whatever, um, or 500. I don't know what it was. And she said, okay, um, I'll come back to you a little bit later. He said, no, don't worry, we're going to go fishing. So we went off fishing, and we came back at the end of the day. And um, as he expected, the piano was gone. <laughs> Uh, whatever he offered her, the other two dealers, the other dealers had come in and actually said, well, I'll give you 50 quid more. So, um, so he said, well, you've done well, well done. Um, can I, um, what about the, 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 um, piano stool? Um, to, to, you know, you've done well on the piano. Um, I'll give you 50, you know, do you want 50 quid for it? And she said, yeah, yeah, nothing to me. And, he knew that the piano was worth virtually nothing. <laughs> yeah. Um, and the, that the, that was why, why it was brought there, but he noticed the stool and the stool was very valuable, very interesting. He, he knew who the maker was, he, you know, whatever. Um, but he, if he didn't give an offer, he knew that it was, whoever was coming next was actually going to just give a little bit more. Yes. Um, so he, the, the actual stool was what was worth the money. And he sold that for thousands. Um, but if you let, it was very difficult because if you let on with what, sometimes you could share with what people had and other times you have to actually be a little bit devious because um, other people, there's a whole series of people who used to follow him around yes. and just offer a few bit more. Um, but he's turned up some very interesting, strange, odd things. Um, uh, yeah, one of them was um, the first pieces that uh, came out of the Meissen factory. So I remember. <laughs> I can't hear you properly, so can I ask you just to lift? Because you said about the. Yeah, factory. is that better? Yes. Yeah, so um, yeah, we've, um, yeah, 
but anyway, it's a lot, a lot of stories, a lot of interesting things. Lot of interest. The, the uh, connection between, and, um, sorry, the connection between pianos for me, when we talk, regardless of being live, you always manage to flick a light bulb because um, the piano you mentioned, not the piano, but a piano, figures greatly in my experiences where music is concerned because I went to a, a choral school and I admire anybody who can play the piano. I admire anybody that can sing. So when I heard you say about the piano and sort of the price involved in, in purchasing one and it was really worthless anyway, brings me to how I kept saying in lockdown. And that was through, um, I like Jack Savaretti, who lives in Oxford and um, obviously has become really famous. I like him because he's got a gravelly voice and he looks awfully good. And he's very, very clever because he not only plays the piano, he plays the guitar and he's, he's just very clever. So during lockdown, I realized that he was digitally switched on because he decided being locked down in his house that he would play the piano. Now the piano he played was something he picked up somewhere. So he obviously saw it at some place or other and thought, I like that piano. And obviously made a bid for it, I would have thought. And here we are fast forward in 2020 during lockdown where he's using that piano because he can't go to the studio. He can't go to BBC One, BBC Two and Radio One and Radio Two. So there he is on Instagram giving his recitation every day solidly. And it was round about, I think it was about 11 uh, midday, he would do it. And he captured moi every day for that time. Because to be able to come from a world stage with backing, with all the, the dynamics, and then to just be in, as I am and you are, in your living room and play the piano and create um, an impact, it takes an awful lot of skill. But he makes yeah, and, it and so it's, easy. It's going back to the joy of doing something. Yes. Uh, and sometimes when you're actually at the um, the peak of your skill, or getting to the peak of your skills, um, uh, you know, there's the, the, the uh, a very good book. It's it's a very dull book, but it's a very important message um, about peak performance. Um, yes. Uh, and it's all about sort of um, deliberate practice. Yes. Uh, and I, so deliberate practice is a habits. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, High performance. That's the Brendan Bruchard. This is um, not uh, not his book. This is um, uh, Peak. Uh, I've got it. Copy of it. I've got the book. Um, and it's 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 very boring, but the message is very is very good. And it's you know there's a lot there's a lot of it. Some of the early studies about how to um, do the thing with numbers and counting numbers and doing these sort of things. And uh, it's yes, yeah, exceedingly dull. But the key thing is about how do you do deliberate practice, how you break it up and how yeah. you actually do things. Yeah. And when you're actually at that level of, you know, top concert pianist or top whatever, um, it is very difficult to actually just go back to the joy of just performing. True. Simply. Uh, and I, and I, but I've noticed a lot of people have actually had the opportunity to go back to do things and do things differently. So, Acquaintance. Uh, it, 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 really... it allows for performance and, and creativity. So you go back to being creative again. Yeah. And uh, there's a, a fantastic guy, Tom Morley, uh, the rhythmic ringmaster, uh, rock star activator. I think ryth rhythmic ringmaster is a, is a fantastic, is, I think his best title. And what um, Tom is very good at doing, he's a very, very smart guy. Um, uh, he, he said to me once, I'm 64, you know, I don't get all this technology. Um, he's as smart as anything. He's probably one of the most insightful people that I that I know. Um, but what he does, uh, every um, he's very good at uh, getting people to really activate and activate that sort of team, that feeling of being together uh, through through drumming. And um, but what, he, what he's doing, you know, it was a real hassle for him to physically turn up with all the drums and get everything going. He'd turn up to events, corporate things, whatever. You have to put them all in his truck and go there. But doing it online, 
he's just changed his life. Yeah. Um, and he's got a fantastic audience uh, every Saturday as part of the Morning Gloryville Morning Rave. Yes, there's up to a thousand people all drumming. Mm -hmm. the, Catherine Jenkins here uh, has done the same. She goes live every Saturday, and you think she's in the Albert Hall every Saturday. She was recently, but normally she's not. She's back home, and she creates the same following. It's massive. But so did Jack yeah. Savaretti, including me. So one of the things that I would talk about there, because it's uh, relevant to what I see Ian and his backdrop, was that while Jack was playing the piano, and obviously has great followings from the fan point of view, globally, his wife was creating a wonderful floral display on the mantelpiece at the back, on the, on the um, shelf. And lots of his fans every day kept asking, I love the flowers, what are they? So in your case, you have a beautiful vase at the background there. And I, I, I believe that, are they fresh, fr fresh flowers? No, or are no, they, no. The, um, they, are, they are dried flowers. And dried it just, flowers. Uh, every, everything is just random. Um, I'm sitting in the corner of my dining room, uh, two boys working, um, and they're both uh, taking the other spots in the house. Um, but this is, uh, yeah, I can get, um, I don't, uh, I don't have Wi-Fi uh, here. So um, on this computer, so we're actually using a, uh, an adapter plug, one of these sort of Wi-Fi that goes around uh, sort of the internet that goes, you know, the ethernet that goes around the ring mains. So I've got a, a, an adapter plug that's going into the kitchen that comes in to power the computer, but it also runs the, uh, the network. Um, so we don't, uh, so it actually works better than Wi-Fi. Um, but I'm just balanced on the corner of a table and there's just a bookcase behind <laughs> and that just happens to be here. So this is where we are. This is where you are. Uh, is it, this is just my observation. Is your vase something that you collected? Was it a collector's piece? No, it's just again, random. Again, random. Uh, yes. The stuff that we have, um, again, random stuff. We don't, we're not collectors. Um, you know, my dad was the person who knew what he was the doing collector. and we have no idea what a lot of the stuff was you know i, I personally i'm not the um yeah I, that's it, it's phenomenal memory but it's not it's just not my world um but uh yeah yes what i would would like to do is to finish our conversation at this point but to say how humble i feel that you've honored me in joining me at such a, a poignant time I'm obviously going to wish you peace because I would have known you long enough. Um, your father's at peace. And I look forward to finding out what Ian wants to do next. The journey he's on. Yes, it's interesting. Um, yeah, I have done a number of different things. Some of them are a bit stupid. Um, treasure hunting was a, was a crazy one. But I, um, uh, yeah, I, wrote a, I wrote an interesting murder story about that. <laughs> Treasure hunting. <laughs> One day I'll publish it. Um, but what I've stumbled into right now, um, and it's, it's a strange one, is uh, creating online events for people. Creating online uh, events for? for yes, for um, what I the one that I like the best so far has been a, for a charity, sort of cha charitable not a charity, but um, it was uh, for a, a group of ladies. I hadn't realised that one in 10 women uh, around the world suffer from endometriosis. Yes. And uh, a lady that um, every March, it's a little while back now, every March uh, people gather together up and down the world and have sort of uh, endo week, uh, an endo weekend where there's awareness, they can come together. But because of the coronavirus and COVID-19, they couldn't do that this year. Physically. So. So we just physically put something on uh, and I helped her to, to do that last minute. Um, and we had no idea whether the technology was going to work. We had no idea whether who was going to come. We didn't know it was going to be 10 people, 10,000 people. So we put this thing on and in the end, 29 people came because the core uh, charities and foundations and big activists that have huge followings decided not to invite all their, their followers until they'd actually physically come and been. But it was the right thing because we had no idea what was going to work and what wasn't. 
and, and they had the opportunity to literally sit in the in the two lounges that we created online so we had lots of content we'd had interviews that we that she'd filmed we had presentations we had whatever and we were streaming those out live but people actually wanted to sit and actually have conversations yes. we had a top surgeon from uh india um who was and his name do you, do you remember his name I, 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 it's not my world so i don't really know who anybody was was he um, practicing and, in london no, no, he was actually in India. In India. And this is what okay. the important thing is, that we were able to connect, rather than having the surgeons coming um, from all over the world, globally. and actually physically having to come somewhere, mm. they could actually spend an hour or so globally. popping in, saying something, sharing something, and physically. actually talking, uh, and actually being, and there was a top doctors from the States, there's activists from all over the world, and they were able to sit there, Amazing. and actually awesome. meet and talk and awesome. share and there was a lot of content which they could go and look at afterwards um but at the end of that um i was asked to actually uh, one of the um right at the end of the, the weekend um amy asked me to uh just record one of the sessions just to make sure that it actually did get recorded um and i found that quite emotional Yes. So it was it was a very much a um, I had re, a a no journey. idea how how hard it is for these ladies yes. um, and how misunderstood they are and how difficult it is for the profession medical profession to to do their thing. Yes. Um, and yeah, so it was very emotional, and I suddenly yeah, realised that there's a great deal of progress that needs to be made in that field. Don't yeah, and, and I just and, and those type of events that yeah. aren't don't really work physically i mean it works physically yes and it's very magical when it's physical but you have to come for so long people have to make a huge journey yes whereas it was better to share the something. information and the technology and yeah obviously the insights yeah and it, and it felt you know i, I popped in and say is everybody okay and they were just shooing me away so it's... nice <laughs> so I, I help help it's a learning curve, but it's also rewarding because that's something that you could bring together and they need your yeah. expertise. And yeah. So we had, I, we, had, we had 54 hours of perfect recordings from all the sessions. Well done. Uh, some very emotional stuff. Um, so I knew the platform suddenly worked. And I thought, right, let's do this. But the thing with the, in the event space is there's a lot of fear. Uh, there's yeah. venues that want to keep hold of the fact they've got a venue to to sell. There's a lot of to get tickets sold and get people flights arranged, get all of these things. There's a lot of risk. There's a lot of money involved. Money involved. You have to rush around and do these things. And digitally, you can uh, save a lot. Yeah, yeah, doing it digitally, but it but also means that the people who are organise events are very good at, at stage managing and project yeah. managing everything. The drama and, and of trust is vital in that respect. So trust yeah. between you know, the person inviting you to take part in that, um, to construct that, to present that, there has to yeah. be a, a level of trust, otherwise it doesn't work. Yeah, but, but what, what's, what's happen what happens with online is you can focus on those things, the human element, yeah. the getting the, it's not about just making sure the plumbing is working at the venue and making sure that the canapes turn up at the right time and you've got the right number and all those sort of things and it's about actually inviting the right people yeah. in the right way making sure the right people that's come true. together have, a, have an environment that's safe enough for them to open up yeah. and actually share what they need to share sometimes it's their their vulnerability we don't know what we don't what, what we need to do but being in a, in a with it in the right group and actually saying i'm lost I'm frustrated, yeah. I want to do something, I don't know how, and somebody next to you says, how about, whatever, let's, and, and that's what happened on that weekend, the way. people could, yeah, Showing and it's way. organizing those type of things to allow people to be human, yes. and allow people to take risks. Humanizing, the human. Yeah, yeah. and it's, yeah. and that is it's, so it's, difficult. It's incredibly uh, humbling, as I've said, and an honor to speak with you, it's easier for us as two humans to be able to see each other. I in my green room and you in yours. And I've made you smile, I hope, and you've made me smile on such a, you know, a very family emotional time. 
yeah. a, a special time. You're a very special person. Thank you. Thank you very uh, much. And, and, and um, you're very special too because you're very good at actually um, connecting people and seeing things um, and seeing that they're not, they're not so obvious. And that's, that's very important. Um, seeing the not so obvious. Yes, it's not Mystic Peg, is it? No, no, no. No. It's just, you know, you, you see things, but you connect it in a way that's, um, that's nice. Um, Thank you. It's nice that um, that, that skill is recognised. It's a natural one, so I don't even know I'm doing it sometimes. But Ian has picked it up. Thank you so much. Have a, have a strength of being, and I wish you peace. Thank you. And thank you again for turning up, showing up, and standing up. Yeah, it was good fun. Thank you. Bye-bye.